And I'd like for you to take the Word of God now, if you would, and open it to Romans chapter 8. This is the 45th sermon in our series through Romans, entitled, Not Ashamed, How the Gospel of God Changes Sinners, or How the Gospel Changes Sinners. Our text tonight is Romans 8, verses 5 through 11. You'll see why in just a bit. And the title for this evening's sermon is part one of several, I'm not certain how many parts, but this is part one, and the title for the message is The Mind of the Spirit. Your first bullet point is this, we'll start out with it. Throughout Romans chapter 8, we see a great emphasis on the Holy Spirit. It's one of those things that you see when you read through the book. If you sit down and just read from start to finish, this is probably one of the things that you would pick up on, and I mentioned it last week, but the Holy Spirit is noticeably uh, less prevalent before chapter 8. And I mean, it, the difference is not even close. Before Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul only mentions the Holy Spirit one time, um, and it's in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. But now, as I said last week, we've turned a bit of a corner in our thinking and in our understanding. So just by way of review, you have Romans 4, 5, 6, and 7 here. And Romans 4 is the Apostle Paul's great emphasis on faith being the means of, by which salvation comes to believers in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. It was Abraham, our father, who was justified by faith. Next, Romans 5 focuses on our present possessions as believers. And boy, did I love that chapter. We have peace with God. We have access by faith. We have all of these different things. And what a joy to know these things are ours as people of faith, people who believe what God has revealed to us. Then, along comes the naysayer. Paul, if you preach that and tell folks you get to heaven by believing in Christ rather than by straightening up and flying right, you're going to have a lot of people who think they're on their way to heaven, but their sin's not dealt with. And they're living in sin, and they sin more and more and more. And their perspective was, well, where grace abounds, sin will much more abound. And Paul flips it on its head. Remember? He says, no, where sin abounds. That is where grace abounds, and it saves and changes sinners Grace, God's grace, changes sinners into the image of Christ. So here's your bullet point. Romans 6 is where Paul begins to argue that this kind of gracious salvation does not produce people who sin more, but people who hate sin and are constantly, and we could say continually, being cleansed from it. So in Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul begins his own testimony. And you can see from verse 7 on, uh, here's your bullet point. Paul outlines his own testimony of how he came to know God's will and how he wrestles at times with sin even now as a believer. But in chapter 8, he shows us where ultimate victory comes from. And this is critical. Here's your point. Ultimate victory cannot come through the flesh. Paul puts that lie to death. And now he wants us to see that it only comes by the presence of the Spirit of God. And someone says, well, that's how you get saved. You know, God convicts you of your sin, and the Lord uh, helps you to understand the things that he has revealed. And yes, he does that. I don't doubt all of that. But Paul is saying this is how the Christian lives that Christ comes by his spirit never to leave, but to change the way that we relate to God, to work within us so that we can cry out to God as a father. And uh, it really is a joy. Now, we can outline the bulk uh, 
of Romans 8 in this way, and these are kind of the five main points that I see as I study through this. We looked at last week, number one, God's Spirit frees us from sin and death and enables us to serve God. Number two, God's Spirit gives us a new mindset. And that's the language the Apostle Paul uses, but as we'll see, we are new creatures in Christ. Who we are is fundamentally changed in Jesus, and that's a joy. Number three, God's Spirit empowers us for victorious living. Lord willing, that will be next week. Number four, God's Spirit confirms our salvation and makes our prayers effectual. This is verses 14 through 16 and 26 and 27. And then number five, God's Spirit guarantees our eternal glorification with Christ. This is verses 17 through 25, and we will even touch on it tonight by the time we get to verses 10 and 11 in our text. And so you'll see, this isn't a perfect outline. There's a lot of overlap. So like the last bit that the Holy Spirit guarantees our eternal glorification with Christ, that's seen in several places throughout. And so there is a lot of overlap. These are kind of the broad stroke themes. And I think we should see with the apostle and with all other saints that the Spirit of God is present with us throughout all of our lives as Christians. The Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit deals with the heart persuasively when the gospel is preached. The Holy Spirit infills and indwells all who believe on Christ. The Holy Spirit serves as a guarantor, that's with a capital G, the guarantor that all who trust in Christ will wind up in heaven and not just present with Jesus, but conformed to the image of of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is important to believers. And we don't look at the Holy Spirit as just sort of a side note, as something that's tangential to our uh, relationship with God. The Holy Spirit is God, as we saw last week. The Holy Spirit is God, and He is with us, and He is working, and He is powerful. And what He does, He does effectively and thoroughly. And we rejoice in that. Um, we certainly do. Praise God for God. Praise God for Jesus, the Son, and praise God for the Holy Spirit. Let's read our text, Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 11. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. This is God's word. Let's bow together and pray. Father, we thank you for this precious truth. We thank you for your word that binds us to you, that reveals our God, that reveals ourselves, that even when we were deceived and deceiving ourselves, You were speaking the truth. You were calling to us. And Lord, we we are glad. We are glad for the kind of God that you are and for the way that you've revealed yourself to us. We rely on you tonight to help us to understand, to help us to trust. And Lord, I pray that you would do that. We're not really called 
to do much in the text tonight. We're called to see you as the God who loves and saves and ultimately redeems not just spirit, but even the body. So Father, help us to take the hint and to rest in you, to trust in you, to get in the yoke with you and learn of Christ. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We thank you for your son, for your spirit. We thank you for who you are. I praise you bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we dig into the passage, let's lay some important groundwork. Number one, your next point, the Spirit of God is God himself. All Christians believe in the triune God because it is plainly taught in Scripture. Jesus shows us that to deny that Jesus is God is to deny God himself. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have the Father. And the same thing is said by the apostle here. If you don't have the Spirit, you don't have God. And so we must understand that uh, to deny Jesus is to deny, to deny God himself. And the same thing goes for the Holy Spirit, who is not an impersonal force or not a power that emanates from the person of God. He is a person. Throughout the Scripture, the Holy Spirit functions with his mind, with his will, with his emotions. He exhibits all the characteristics of personhood. He relates to God the Father as one with him and as being a distinct person with him. He is distinct, and yet he is never separate from God the Father. Here's a couple of things we see about the Holy Spirit in Scripture. The Holy Spirit relates with the saints in full power of a person. Number one, loving them. Number two, teaching, guiding, and comforting them. Number three, empowering them. We believe that the church started in his apostles and was empowered at Pentecost. Number four, unifying them. Number five, indwelling them, or we could say dwelling in them. Number six, filling them. Number seven, praise God, securing them. Don't you rejoice in that? Number eight, giving them gifts. A whole chapter there if you want to dig into it. And then lastly, producing fruit in their lives. Here's your bullet point. This is also important to remember. All that the Holy Spirit does, he does to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. He never seeks his own glory. And the surest sign that the Holy Spirit is in a place is if the people are thinking well of, loving, and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, if you want to run that litmus test in my job site, is the Holy Spirit filling this place? Well, ask yourself, are the people thinking rightly of, and speaking well of, and loving, and knowing, and submitting to, and serving Jesus Christ? You could ask it about your home. Is my home a place where the Spirit of God is? Well, is it a place where people are glorifying Christ? You could ask it about your church. Is my church a place where the Holy Spirit dwells? Here's the answer. Are the people there glorifying Christ? If they are, then they are being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit has promised he will do within people. Where Christ is glorified, you can know the Holy Spirit is at work. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will not speak about himself. He won't make a big deal about himself. He will make a big deal about Jesus Christ. That's good to know, isn't it? Here's your next bullet point. Paul now argues that the Holy Spirit works in every Christian in effectual ways. The Holy Spirit is not impotent. He is not weak. He is not powerless. Nor is he subject to my will or my whims. The truth is, even when I am weak or rebellious, the Holy Spirit is present and he is working. Even when I resist him and I sin, he is still present and he is still working. His strength is not diminished by whether or not I am perfectly obedient. Now, that's not to say that my life is going to be the same whether I obey his leading or not. Your life and my life will certainly be better when we are submitted to him, but even believers who are obstinate and stubborn, 
Even folks like in the church at Corinth where Paul says, I could not speak to you except as to carnal people. Here you are believers behaving like you're not believers. Even those people will wind up in heaven in the end. Do you know why? Because the Holy Spirit is strong. The Holy Spirit is powerful. And what he does, he does well and he does right even those who wrestle with god's spirit within them as jacob wrestled with god without even those people find out that the holy spirit is more powerful than they are in the end and isn't that a blessing isn't it a joy to know that our security and our ultimate salvation does not rest in our power but in the power of god isn't that a blessing all right here's your next bullet point and we'll get into number one it's good to know that our eternal salvation lies not in our own limited and finite power, but in the Lord's unlimited and eternal power. Our first point is this, the spiritual mind, verses 5 and 6. And Paul gives us a true dichotomy in this passage. He's saying, essentially, there are two types of people in the world, and only two. And you say, well, we could divide people by all sorts of metrics. We can say that there are men, there are women. We can divide by height, by weight, by social class, by eye color, by hair color, family, heritage. There are many, many variables. When we were on vacation, my children said, Dad, can we play Guess Who? And I said, sure. And uh, so we sat down and we popped all the different people up. How many of you have played Guess Who before? Yeah, and so my little girl says, is your person a girl? And I said, well, I don't want to assume their gender. No, I'm just kidding. You know, I said, is it a girl? And you say, yes or no. And then you flip down, do they have a hat? You flip down, to, or do they have, you know, big teeth or a small nose and all these kinds of things, all these different metrics. But Paul is saying there are really two kinds of people if you boil it all down to what matters the most. And here's your bullet point. The most important category the one which God alone sees and knows is whether or not a person is born again or lost. Not things that we can see from the outside. There are those who are in Christ and there are those who are not. There are those who have the Spirit of God and belong to God and there are those who do not have the Spirit of God and do not belong to Him. Now in verse 5, Paul calls these two categories they that are after the flesh and they that are after the spirit. Here's your bullet point. To be after something, and this is as we saw last week, is to have that mindset, that affection, or that walk. And all of those things are seen in the scripture, and we'll dig into some of that here, though we won't be super thorough just for sake of time. Uh, Paul is making this very clear here. Here's your next bullet point. If you are after a thing, and that's just my own way of saying after the flesh or after the spirit, then you mind that thing. You are, and this is your blank, subject to that thing, and you are at enmity with the opposite thing. So when it comes to minding the flesh or the spirit, you are either going to find that you are pleasing to God or you are displeasing to God. There's two categories into which all people fall. Here's your next point. The idea of minding a thing. So when he says in verse 5, uh, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That mind is phreneo. It's rendered do mind in verse 5. And the noun, which is rendered as minded two times in verse 6, and mind in verse 7. The verb and the noun, but the same word, freneo. So uh, it's kind of like saying, do you want to take the dog on a walk? Noun, and I walked over here, verb. It's a similar kind of thing. We're expressing the same sort of idea here, though one's a noun and one is a verb. Now here's your point, next one. The word has to do with our leaning, our bent, and this is most importantly, our desires. So Jesus is giving us a window into uh, what, we, what we want. 
what we desire. A dear friend of mine asked me years ago, where does your mind go when you let it wander? I thought that was a good question. In fact, it's stuck with me now some 15 years later. When you let your mind wander, where does it go? Do you have to corral the thing in? Do you have to keep your, your body under subjection? You know, this has stuck with me. Uh, is there a default setting where your mind goes? The first time that this word phreneo appears in our Greek New Testament is very interesting. It's where Jesus is speaking to Peter. And, and the idea, remember, is being minded of something. In Matthew 16, verse 23, you have it in your notes. Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me. For thou, what is the word there? Savorest. Phreneo. You do not savor the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And here we have the flesh and the Spirit of God. Again, the same dichotomy. And we understand what Jesus was saying to Peter, don't we? Do we understand what Jesus is saying? Here's your bullet point. Jesus is speaking of Peter's appetite, his internal desires. And I'm thankful for the Bible that I use, the King James Bible, how they would use such breadth of words to kind of help us understand what they're talking about or what the word means. They could have said, uh, get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense to me, for thou mindest not the things that be of God. They could have easily put that in, but they didn't. They give us some flavor, pardon the pun, and they say, you don't savor. Your appetite is not for the things of God. It is for the things of men. You're thinking about things wrongly. And Paul's speaking about the same thing in Romans chapter 8. There are those whose internal affections are unchanged. They've not been made partakers of the life of God. And to be carnally minded, we are reminded, is death. And we all understand sin leads to death. Sin leads to actual physical death. The apostle has made that point before, and I think he's making a different point here, and it's your bullet point. Anyone who has not been born again of the Spirit of God remains unchanged inside. They're after the flesh. They savor the things of the flesh and is separated from the life of God. This is the kind of death that the apostle is speaking about here. Now, that's not to say that all people are separated from God's grace. God has been gracious to you your whole life. God has been gracious to me my whole life. God is gracious to the wicked and to the good. God is gracious to the worst of the worst and the best of the best and everybody in between. God is very, very gracious. What this means is that people who are not born again of the Spirit of God are divorced from the life that is in God the quality of life that God possesses. More than that, here's your bullet point. More than that, the lost are separated from the peace that is in God as well. And this peace, as we have previously discussed in earlier texts, is objective peace with God. In Christ, the war with God is over. The enmity is done. God has won. Our knees have bowed to him, not because we did anything, but because God was satisfied with Christ's sacrifice, and Christ satisfied God's wrath by the sacrifice himself and his offering of his own blood as a once-for-all sacrifice. Here's your bullet point. Believers have both objective peace with God through the sacrifice of Jesus and subjective peace that passes all understanding in our circumstances. So they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. One of the fruits of the Spirit. Peace. When God's Spirit is present, he produces something that we cannot produce in and of ourselves, and that's peace, even in trial. 
even in turmoil. Some of my heroes of the faith are Thomas Cranmer, Hugh Latimer, and Nicholas Ridley. How many of you have heard of Cranmer, Latimer, and Ridley? Latimer and Ridley are generally spoken of together, and Cranmer is a separate gentleman. The three, these three Church of England saints were all martyred in 1555 as heretics, but they were true Christians. Hugh Latimer is in Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's recorded of him having said to Ridley, quote, be of good comfort and play the man, Master Ridley. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out, end quote. As they burned uh, Latimer and Ridley, Thomas Cranmer was assigned to a particular tower where he could watch them burn. There was a prison tower, and he was up there where he could see the whole thing, and it was a tragic, tragic end. They lit the fire on wet wood, and it burned them uh, and took hours and hours and hours for them to die. But it was Nicholas Ridley on the evening of his execution was consigned to a jail cell and his brother came to him and offered to comfort him. And he said, I will sit with you and bring you comfort. And Nicholas Ridley declined the offer and he replied this, quote, I intend, God willing, to go to bed and sleep as quietly tonight as ever I did, end quote. And that he did. And he played the man until his final breath. You say, where does such peace come from? It comes from God's spirit within a man. It's not the spirit of man, right? This isn't the strength that he's drumming up from inside of him. It is God empowering his people, the presence of God's spirit. Now, here's your point. Those who are gods are after the spirit and mind the things of the spirit. We would say those are things that tend to, toward life and peace. There are practical applications to that. You understand. God's people are not morbid. We're not morbid. We don't want to glorify things that are, are wicked and cruel and violent. We want the things that tend toward life and peace. Why? Because we've been made spiritually binded. Now, it doesn't mean that we never have lapses. It doesn't mean that we never have failures or fall short. It doesn't mean that we don't do things and wish we had done or said or thought better. Here is what it means. I've given you a good quote from Brother MacArthur. He says, quote, here in verse 5, Paul is speaking of the determinate spiritual pattern of a person's life, whereas in verses 8 and 9, he is speaking about the spiritual sphere of a person's life. To this I agree, and I recommend that we move on to that spiritual fear sphere of a person's life. And number two is this, the subjected mind. Verses seven, eight, and nine. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Now when we speak of the mind, we are speaking of the phreneo, the savoring, the, the bent of a person's desires. After all, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, Proverbs 23, verse 7. Here's your bullet point. Paul reminds us what the early chapters of Romans were teaching us all along. That is all, that's your bullet point, who do not have the Spirit of God within them are at enmity with God. And someone may look good. They may even appear religious. But if God were to speak to them, he would say, why persecutest thou me? God sees and he knows and he understands that those who do not have his spirit are at enmity with God. Here's your bullet point. Enmity is ekthra. And six out of the seven times it's used in the Bible, it's translated as enmity. And once in Galatians 5 verse 20, it's translated as hatred. And I think that gives us a pretty good idea of what the word means, doesn't it? All who are not yet born of the Spirit do not have the love of God shed abroad in their heart. They do not have a proper love for God. They may create an idol in their heart or with their hands. They may shower it with affection, with praise, with service. But here's your point. 
apart from salvation in Jesus' name, no person knows or loves God. There is one gospel, the gospel of Christ. And the opposite of this is true. Your next bullet point. The opposite is true. The lost are strongly opposed to God. We look at salvation as a miracle. When a person bows the knee to Christ and they're saved, there are some amazing things that have happened in their life, and we call that a testimony. And every person here has a testimony. You can tell how God worked, can't you? You can tell how God opened your eyes to see truth and to seek after him and to know him and to love him. Now, there is a strong, Paul is teaching us, an enmity. And we would call this hatred, antipathy, or opposition to the one true God. And we would say it is the lot of all people from birth. Now let me clarify this statement, and I hope that it's helpful to you. All men are born this way. There are not people who are born into different classes. Some loving God, some hating God. There are not some who are born with God's affection and some born at enmity with him. We're not born into different classes. We're all born the same way. And the fact that this is our lot from birth simply means that there is not a separate event in the life of a person that makes them at odds with God. The scripture teaches us that we are at odds with God when we are not in Christ. We are at odds with God by virtue of our connection to Adam. And the sons and daughters of Adam needed a redeemer. Here's your bullet point. It is not as though some people are born with a specific parentage or religious connection that makes God pleased with them while others are born without the life of God in them. And here's your next point once you get there. All men born of Adam need a second birth. And the new birth brings a fundamental change to our character, which we could call our mindset, which is what Paul uses here, our bent or our nature. Let me give you this verse from Paul 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new, what's the word? Creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, when I was a boy, I heard creature, and I thought, you know, Hollywood. I thought someone in a rubber suit, and that's what you think, you know, the creature from the Black Lagoon and that is not at all what Paul is saying. He's saying you are a new creation. You are a newly created thing. There's a new creation that takes place. So all who are in Christ are new creations in Christ. That's a glorious truth. Now, when did your nature become impacted with sin? in the Garden of Eden. And we can slip into different depths of degradation. That's very, very possible. I think Paul explains that well in Romans chapter 1. But a person must be born again if they are ever to see the kingdom of God. And Paul says the way to be a new creation, a new creature, is to be in Christ and the old things are passed away, and all things are become new. It doesn't mean completely perfected. It means new. You are a new creation in Jesus. What you were in Adam, you are not in Christ. What you are in Christ is fundamentally different from what you were before. Now look at verse 8 of Romans chapter 8. The flesh lacks any strength to please God. The smoothest talking gent and the sweetest sounding lady do not impress the Holy One of Israel. 
the kindless, gentlest person does not impress the one who created them because they are made in his image and in his likeness. And the weakness of God's law is found in our sinful flesh. And Christ, who was made, as we saw last week, in the likeness of sinful flesh, that is, he had a body, yet he was without sin, perfectly fulfilled the law and became our substitution, the substitution for all sinners. Find John 16 with me if you would. We see how wonderful and how powerful the law is in the hands of the lawgiver. You see how Christ wields his law? You see how Christ takes up his law and wields it in order to defeat the devil and set the captives free? But for us, we have no strength to please God. The law is a sword in the stone for us. The law is Excalibur, and we are not King Arthur. The law cannot be wielded in our hands. We have no strength in our flesh to please God. But Jesus comes. Oh, it's quite different. And he pleased his father through perfect obedience. And look at what he says, John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Jesus says, I got a lot more I would say to you, but you're not ready yet. But I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. When my spirit comes to you. Now, here's your next bullet point. Consider the words of Romans 8. Verse 9, real quick, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, here's your bullet point. This indwelling of the Spirit of God in the bodies of believers, Romans 8, verse 9, began at Pentecost. And it continues to this day. If God's Spirit is within you, you are at peace with God by the sacrifice of Christ, and you can please God because God is in you. But if not, you are only in the flesh and you are at enmity with God and unable to please him. That which is born of flesh, Jesus said, is flesh. Only, here's your bullet point, only the spirit-empowered person is truly subject to the law of God. As Romans 8 verse 7 says. Because the law is spirit. And if you think that the law is just doing a list of good and avoiding a list of bad, if you think the law simply governs our externals, read it sometime. In God's law, we're called to love. We're called to desire. We're called to think. So much more than just acting. The law makes demands on, well, here's your, your bullet point. Jesus taught us God's law makes demands concerning our lusts, desires, and thoughts. It's more than actions. It's obedience in our very attitudes and our heart's desires, which is what God requires in his law. And here's your bullet point. What God requires in his law, he regulates by his spirit. Consider the difference between these two positions. If you want to look these up or write them down, you can. But listen to what Jesus says in John 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The condemnation came according to Jesus, not because of our actions, but because of our affections. 
Though it's not easy to distinguish the two all the time, right? The Holy Spirit, or Jesus says, men loved darkness because their deeds were evil. So what's wrong here? Is it the bent of the heart or the deeds of the hand? And we would say, yes. It's more than what you do. It is the love that's in your heart that needs to be condemned. Men are condemned not simply because they don't do what they're told, but because they're at war with God. They're at enmity with God. They love darkness and hate God. Consider what Jesus told the Pharisees. Matthew 6, verse 24. He said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Pharisees, you are either serving God or you are serving money, one or the other. And Jesus expressed to them that they devoured widows' houses that they loved the praise of men. They loved the wealth that they got. Now get this one, Luke 11, verse 42. But woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. This, these ye ought to have done and not to leave the other undone. Jesus says, yes, the outward stuff is fine, but your affections have not been made right. You don't love God. You don't judge as God judges. You're not spiritually minded. Well, what a shame. He says in John 5, verse 42, again to the same people, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. And then in your notes, Look at what Jesus says to them. If God were your father, don't fill it out yet. Does he say, you might love me? You'd have a better chance of loving me? What does our Savior say? You would love me. If God were your father, Jesus says, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. So, when we come to the words of the apostles, and we read things like this, it's in your notes, Romans 5, verse 5, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. When we read something like 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9, that says, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. This is pretty obvious. Here's your bullet point. When we come to read those words, like Romans 5, verse 5, and 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9, we must come to grips with the fact that something changed in the person to produce such a change of affections. And Jesus refers to this change in 1 John 8, verse 42, as the new birth whereby a person becomes a child of God. And that is what Paul is speaking about here. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Here's your bullet point. Believers, by their new nature, have an affection, or we would say a mind, as Paul says, for the things of God. They savor the things of God. The things of the flesh, maybe McDonald's. Someone says, do you want to go to McDonald's? There's an age, there's a maturity level that says, yeah, I want McDonald's. I don't know anyone over the age of 40 that wants McDonald's. Your appetites have changed. You savor something different, right? Well, believers, by their new nature, have an affection for the things of God. They prefer his person, his government, his laws, his wages, his people, his presence, and his kingdom. 
Have you ever heard a lost person mocking God and they say, I would go anywhere if I didn't have to be around the monster you worship in the Scripture? That evil God. And as a Christian, you say, I feel quite opposite. I want to be with him. I want to be near him. I know what I deserve, and I know what he's given me in Christ. I prefer him. I prefer his kingdom. I prefer his people. I prefer his presence. And I know you feel the same way. We are his subjects. We gladly proclaim Jesus is Lord. Number three, and I got to get through this quickly. Number three is the spirited mortal. This is verses 10 through 11. And again, we're talking about us in the interim. We've been changed. We're not what we once were, but more change is to come. We are not yet what we shall be. And the spirited mortal speaks to the idea in verses 10 and 11 that we are not yet what we shall be. Verse 10 is speaking about the present tense, our current situation as believers. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So you have this two things that is, and that's bad English, but is, right? The, the body was dead. The body will be dead. The body is dead. The spirit was life. The spirit shall be life. No, the spirit is life. So you have these two conflicting things happening at the same time. It, it describes the current situation of believers. Here's your bullet point. Christ is in us by his spirit, and our body is dead, but our spirit is life. And the blank there is the word Christ. And it points us back to the reality of Romans 7. Our physical bodies are not yet dead. We are consigned to a body that is consigned to death, but it is not yet dead. But we are consigned to death because of sin. Because we chose sin. Because we preferred sin. Because we loved darkness. Because we wanted sin. And when given the opportunity, we pursued sin. And so the body is dying. The body is dead. The body shall die. Here's your bullet point. Since Adam sinned, we are born as sinners. What does that mean? It means marred and subject to death. Even little babies die. We were talking this week. We have two in heaven. Not because of their rebellion, but because they are marred by the same curse that's affected us old folks as well. Because our nature has been changed. So we are prone to death. Subject to death. Now, Here's your bullet point. And this is glorious. Your body is consigned to death because of sin. But the spirit, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, is life because of righteousness. And we must understand how, how broad this life is. Before we get to that, I want to say we are speaking about the righteousness of Christ, which he imparts to us at our justification at the new birth. The righteousness of Christ, which he works in us through sanctification. The righteousness of Christ, which he will perfect in us when we see him at our glorification. Here's your bullet point. This is the result of the work of Christ on the cross and your acceptance of it by repentance and faith. We repent of our sins and we turn to Christ for his righteousness. And this is important. There's a lot of controversy about this today and hopefully this will be helpful to you, but Repentance in the New Testament is always turning from sin to righteousness. And anyone who thinks that's a work salvation does not understand whose righteousness saves us. Repentance is turning from my sin, but not to my righteousness. Repentance is turning from my sin to Christ's righteousness. Repentance is me finding my righteousness in Christ, there's no salvation in my own righteousness. I must turn from my sins to the spotless righteousness of Jesus Christ. In other words, I must be forgiven and I must be cleansed of what I am and what I've done. And the only way that can happen is by turning to Jesus Christ. There is no other Savior. And the Bible says this is the hope of glory in Colossians 1 verse 27. 
Christ in you. Here's your bullet point. The apostle asks this, if the Spirit of God is in you, what do you think will become of your body? So do we have an example of anyone who had the Spirit dwelling within him, who died, maybe on a cross, and was buried, maybe in a borrowed tomb? What happened? Do we have any example? Oh, yes, we do. Jesus Christ. And we may look at the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God raised up Jesus and would not allow his flesh to see corruption. It's an interesting phrase. But it just means that when he was raised, there was no rot. There was no decay. There was no uh, parts missing. It was absolutely whole. It was perfectly functional. Jesus sat and looked and reached and touched and talked and ate. He related with people in a resurrected body that was perfectly whole without rot or decay. Now, this is important because we do believe there are remaining scars in the body of Jesus Christ. And I think that was intentional. But here's your next bullet point, and this might be interesting to you. Christ was marred beyond all recognition, Isaiah 52, verse 14. But when he showed himself to his disciples, they knew who he was unless he purposefully hid his identity. And if your body was marred and you were healing for three days, if it was marred so that people looked and said, that's not even a human, it looks like a worm and not a man, and you healed for three days, let me tell you, you still would not be recognizable. Jesus was. Think of Thomas when Jesus came to him, revealed himself to him. The disciples uh, on the road when Jesus opens their eyes so they can see who he is. Think of Peter who leapt from the boat and swam to shore because he knew it was Jesus. Even when Christ arose, other saints arose with him. And their bodies there were not filled with rot or decay, but they were recognizable as saints who had gone on before. So consider your own body now dead because of sin. And by dead, I mean it's on its way. It's on its way. You cannot hear like you used to hear. I said you cannot hear like you used to hear. You cannot see like you used to see. You cannot sing like you used to sing. You can't even think like you used to think. You cannot speak like you used to speak. Some of our young people are getting a taste of it. And some of our older folks are experiencing this in full. Here's your bullet point. The body of this death slowly strips away every power in which we could trust. But our weakness can never diminish the power of God's Holy Spirit. And we go back to where we started. Christ, by His Spirit, is powerful. He is not impotent. He is not weak. We are weak. We are fading. We are failing. He is strong. He will not fade. He will not fail. There was an old saint who was passing. And a pastor went to visit this saint. And the Man was very burdened because his habit for nearly 50 years as a Christian was to wake up every morning and repeat the promises of God to himself and encourage himself in the Lord by the scriptures, by the promises of God. And he woke up one morning and he began to quote the promises and he realized he didn't remember a one of them. And it was a young preacher who was coming to visit him and he'd been praying, God, help me, give me something to say. And he sat with him and the old man was crying and he said, I have forgotten every promise that God ever made to me. And God's spirit was there and gave wisdom to this pastor and he said, but God has not forgotten one. It's true. It's true. God will not forget. Paul speaks of this and I've given it to you in your notes, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 53 through 58. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 
so in this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this immortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. About the third line down, if you want to circle the word then, just remember this has not happened yet. Then. And Paul says it's coming, and the same Spirit that raised up Christ will raise us up. It is a future hope that the apostle points us to once more. If the Spirit of God is in you, you have eternal life in Him. We do not rest in our own strength. We rest in the power of our God. Would you bow with me in prayer? Love divine, all loves excelling. Joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion. Pure, unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation. Enter every trembling heart. Breathe, O oh breathe, thy loving spirit into every troubled breast. Let us all in thee inherit. Let us find the promised rest. Take away our love of sinning. Alpha and Omega be. End of faith as its beginning. Set our hearts at liberty. Come, almighty, to deliver. Let us all thy life receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy temples leave. Thee we would be always blessing. Serve thee as thy hosts above. Pray and praise thee without ceasing. Glory in thy perfect love. Finish then thy new creation. Pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Changed from glory into glory. Till in heaven we take our place. Till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Father, make these blessings ours in Christ. May we trust to them, and may we trust to your word. And we thank you in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen.